Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our regular Monday stream. Uh, this is, I guess, the last of our guest streams for a little while. Uh, it will be, yes. Hmm. A fitting as it is, well, this isn't the last stream of March, but I guess it's the second to last stream of March. So it's been it's been a guest-heavy March, but we've enjoyed it. Um, some of you may remember him. Some of you may have seen him in person. He's a very good public speaker and a decent friend of the channel. Say hello, uh, Mr. Panama Hat. Uh, hello there. Um, good evening, everyone. And uh, yes, I've uh, I've been watching um, some of the recent streams. Um, very very much enjoyed them, um, as always. I especially like the one on the hope not hate report, um, just because <laughs> it was kind of po poignantly funny. <laughs> because I because I I, re I didn't I really hadn't realized how how low that they had they had come um, in their own hierarchy and how how bad they actually are. At, at getting any info on people, I I I, I really like your your uh, exposure of their their promotion of uh, one uh, academic agent, <laughs> basically, it, where they just they yeah. just they just wrote a sort of CV statement for him. They were so, they're going through the mo even they like they seem bored by their own existence, but that's yeah. uh, oh man, that that seems to be a lot of the weird NGO net stuff we've noticed, and it seems to be like groaning under its own weight almost and, and don't hold your breath because there's going to be more of yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. don't take your meds you'll love this next shadow person yeah no exactly <laughs> but yes uh and, thank um, you i i don't want to derail this oh sorry i know it's, I, I go on no no please please continue oh, sorry i don't know if that was a bit of delay there um uh i don't want to derail the stream too early but uh, i can't help r resisting uh mentioning the uh the momentous news that has come down to us from Scotland. Uh... Oh, I, I have to admit, I don't know what you're talking about. I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> it totally escapes me. Hamza Husev? Um, yeah, who? Yeah. Sorry, never heard of him, mate. Sounds like he makes a, well, a shit curry, to be honest. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah, it, 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 I think it will actually be relevant because uh, I, I notice, of course, now that uh, England and Scotland... Is, or maybe, is Ireland as well? No, I don't know. Um, run by, um, shall we say, subcontinentals, um, which uh, <sighs> strikes me as, yeah, ironic. But that that will it will come up because, of course, one of the poems that we will talk about today is the Ballad of the White Horse about uh, Alfred resisting <laughs> foreign invasion. <laughs> so yes. uh, I think I think that'll be relevant today. And there's certainly sub something. Uh... Um... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I shall make sure we get it out of the way just now, and we shall thank the uh, people who turn up for the streams. Yes. And engage with the chat and do the, the super chats and uh, donate to what is currently the, the PayPal at the moment, I believe. Yes, there are, our non-Google link still is the PayPal. I cannot get entropy to work for the life of me. I mean, you could also, if you choose to, support us on uh, Substack as well, because I noticed someone gave us one of the... Uh, founders of things uh, at some point last month and I must have missed it so whoever you are a uh, big thank you for that yes we also do write on the substack there will be a piece out there on Thursday uh, we're, we're trying to keep it weekly it was bi-weekly for a while but we uh... other things take precedence yeah yeah we, that, that was more of a bonus than anything uh, our content generally is on Mondays uh, in terms of the primary stream and Thursdays on the Substack, that is the way it's kind of been and, and will be. It will occasionally be substituted for Tuesdays if things are you know ready in a bit advance. And we do also at the moment do a Wednesday stream as well, but that is again kind of a bonus thing since we have so much to get through. Um, but today we just thought we'd get uh, Mr. Panama Hut on to have a, a bit of a, a gab about the book that he's. I, I should not refer to it as your book, as you said. Because no, you, it's Panama Hat's book. It's Panama, it's, you know, we've decided it's Panama Hat's book, but you don't actually just, get royalties for it. I will say I, I've just switched to my phone um, because the internet on the PC was too unreliable. Um, is, is the sound still okay? Uh, you sound a little bit like on a phone, but I'm just. Uh, hopefully, you didn't blow people's ears out there. <laughs> yeah, I've turned you down a bit. But yeah. yes, if you were to buy a copy of Imperium Anthology of English Verse, uh, yes. edited by one Benjamin Affer, you will find a small picture of a frog inside. I presume is the uh, sort of brief <laughs> uh, profile on yourself as a tweed-wearing, pipe-smoking uh, man of the previous century or so. Man of frog. I've actually oh, got no, no, the, it, uh, the nice kind of three D image here too. I can flash. Ooh. Ooh. 
no it's um it's not um really my book um i i merely wrote the introduction and helped edit some of the selections and um spent many 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 weeks um arguing the case that some poems should or shouldn't be included and um of course because we want the we wanted the book to be pocket sized we we didn't we didn't want to bring out this massive tome um we wanted it to be something that you could just sort of carry around with you like a sort of slice of uh mm. you know a, a slice of of our Verse, past yes. and our culture sort of in your pocket um so that meant of course we couldn't include everything we wanted to and we you know argued and you know spilled ink and shed tears and so forth <laughs> but uh but no many, i'm very happy with how it turned out now many balls of a uh... Sutliff, uh, creme brulee, pipe creme brulee. tobacco <laughs> yeah. spilled. Yeah, if you're in the yeah. US, that's available probably cheapest on the Imperium Press website. If you're on the U- if you're in the UK, I believe Ooh. that is uh, available on Amazon. Is but... that how much they're wanting for the paperback on Amazon? On Amazon, yeah. Well, um, you might be you might be cheaper to just suck up for the shipping for Imperium. Yeah, I, it, it it it's it seems to be that the better place to get it is Imperium Press. But how, how did how did this come about then? Just a, just a brief kind of um, uh, introduction to how you ended up editing a uh, a book on English verse. Well, a, a gentleman called uh, Mike, I only know him as Mike, who uh, who I believe runs or at least works for Imperium Press, um, originally had the idea for bringing out sort of a uh, dissident rights own anthology of great poetry um, because uh, he's sort of, you know, he wants the dissident right to develop its own you know, kind of cultural senses and, you know, have a, a better understanding of, of arts and, and these sorts of things that, that are very important to, to who um, Western Europeans are as a people, I suppose. And he originally reached out to um, the, uh, the well-known Mr. John Dee um, about it. And um, John Dee um, referred him to me um, because he thought I would be better suited for it. So I, I received a message about that um sometime last summer i think around may june and then um it was agreed that i would write a six thousand word introduction to the book and um help edit um and choose which poetry poems went in um sort of make a make a long list and then a short list etc that kind of thing um so the the introduction um is actually quite lengthy and it's it's really more of an essay on why poetry uh matters um to us and why it's sort of more more broadly why art matters to us i suppose because um i it's it's been a question i've thought about a lot more since um sargon uh, asked me at the last um shildings event he said well um just can, can you give me an answer sort of well you know so say, say somebody says well i don't care about poetry it's all you know point pointless and poncy and whatever you know what 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 answer would you give and i and i sort of said well you have to remember that a lot of this poetry is all part of the same continuum from the kind of great epics and epic sort of um, epic storytelling and epic verse and, and sort of musical traditions that are the kind of almost the founding blocks of a people, really. Mm, yeah. um, that, that this, that kind of poetry and the arts as a whole are, in a sense, the blood. That the, the the sort of the blood or the trace that people leave behind them as they go through history. Yes, you know the fact that, of, in the sense gone. that uh, De Maestra talks about, you could you could see it as sort of m- the retelling of myths and stories and legends that don't require exactly. modern day literacy as we think about it. Not yes. to not to totally upend where you are, but I think for a little bit of context on the stream because I know it's it's certainly where I'm coming from, and it will very much be where. A number of people raised in Britain in the last twenty or so years will be coming from as well. Is that <clears throat> try as I might, I struggle not to just roll my eyes when people bring up something about poetry because, frankly, the the introduction I got to poetry in school was Carol Ann Duffy. Oh, poet laureate to the Queen. No, oh, that'll be all <laughs> oh, interesting. Me. And yeah. what she actually, well, we'll... yeah, I would say what she wrote was dry quasi feminist <laughs> trait that was extremely off putting that meant when we sort of then looked at some more interesting stuff like sonnets from Shakespeare that I was like, well, 
this is cool and all, but it's not as cool as like the you know Caesar and Midsummer Night's Dream and Macbeth, because the form I associate with poetry is associated with this dry feminist shit. Yeah. So for me, it's it's very yeah. much something I would like to, you know, unplug myself from that, as it were, and and re-understand poetry and more specifically verse, as as you're talking about it there. You know, a complete reflection of myth telling and story that connects back. You know, who knows how many thousands of years in some sense. Um. Yes. I mean, I think we'll we'll definitely talk more about um the problem with modern poetry and modern education um and what and what i would refer to as the court poets people like carol ann duffy who are kind of um they're they're kind of a, a they have this paradoxical situation of being extremely kind of socially transgressive but also being a part of the regime sort of very much at the heart of the establishment you know mm. um we'll, we'll we'll talk about that i mean i, I will say i if, if there's a silver lining to that story you told you know i'm it's it's very wonderful that you instinctively rejected the works of someone like Carol Ann Duffy. You know? um, even even if you were more broadly interested, it's just you know you you can tell from the beginning um, that you know some 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 uh, types of modern art are just inferior. I think yes, it is quite a difficult thing to get into because it has deliberately, I believe, been hobbled and it has is yeah. is displayed as poncy. I don't think it was even we did get the Carol Ann, Carol Ann Duffy stuff as well. Because she was poet laureate for ages, yeah. wasn't she? But yeah, we also, yeah. I, looking back on it now and, and remembering, even in like primary school, we must have been some of the first people to get like the NGO syllabus style stuff. Because in year, oh, yeah. kind of year six, we were being given like weird refugee poems and yeah. and you know African verse, mm. and it was all. It was all very bizarre, and even the teachers seemed to not quite understand yeah, why we're doing the, it. What we got was so much worse, though, because obviously in Scotland, almost to some extent, I think because of Gaelic and other kind of things, has, has an almost even richer and more obvious history with poetry. Yes, I mean, yeah, the, the first thing that comes so. to mind is Robert Burns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we got some of the weird NGO stuff and Robert Burns thrown in. Oh, so yes. it all becomes so confusing, and I think, not to, you know, go on a whole different sideline, that actually there is like a, in a way that Gunon talks about in uh, Sacred and Profane, oh, Sacred and Profane, sorry, uh, Rena Quality and Sign of the Times, that through art being materialised, you know, we, we experience it in youth in these really poor forms, you know, with Carol Ann Duffy and terrible modern art, and oh, look at this, yeah. uh, you know, photograph gallery of these people coming across you know, the Mediterranean Sea and what was them? They used to have that one up in the uni I was in. Yeah. And then yeah. what happens is you end up essentially rejecting all art. And that, I think, is the attitude, you know, the sort of people who would be like, ha-ha, well, you know, the... the Not, what was the... The Dali mini thing it is funny because it puts shit lab artists out of jobs and who cares mm -hmm. about art? That's for toffs and weirdos. It's like, no. As, as you said earlier on, Hat, you know, it isn't even necessarily books and you know treaties that will get us out of what we are in. It will be great works. It will be art. It yeah. will be verse. It will be statues, architecture, whatever it is. And that to understand that you have to understand at least something about art. But they are just so indeter or determined to drill into us the worst forms of it, so that we reject it wholesale. In in my opinion, I, I I completely agree. It's it's the reason that 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 children are are basically taught badly. They're taught bad art badly, um, and it's a it's a deliberate sort of cultural bomb. I think because it creates um, a total disconnect and disinterest in a kind of cultural history of the of the place and the and the people that you come from, mm. um, which of course makes for very docile kind of cattle if you're from the point of view of the sort of of, of the regime if you like um and i think that as i said it, it's being done deliberately um in order to foster that there's and then it, it's very odd because as far as i can tell there have been two types of sort of civilization and then ours as a third so if you go back before the industrial age um well, every every country, every people 
had epics and kind of national epics and and sort of um, what I would call poetry of the commons, you know, the, the verse that everybody knows, whether they're literate or not, you know. And because very often people prior to the industrial age either couldn't read or didn't have access to books or both, these poems, these songs would be taught, would be sort of passed down orally. You know, you would, people would sit around and hear them recited and then they would learn them by way of that and be able to recite them and they would be passed on and passed on. Um, and this, this is still around in some places. I, I know that AA talks about uh, in Persia, which is a country very steeped in the poetic, its own poetic traditions. But even today, you can walk down the streets of a city or in the country and ask people and they will be able to recite huge chunks of ancient Persian poetry, you know, huge, huge chunks of, of, of all that kind of stuff, because it's, it's passed on still. You know, it's, it's part of life there. You, you just you learn the songs and the poems of your people as as you as you sort of come of age, as you as you begin to realize who and, and what you are, I suppose. Sorry, I um, and to, this this, this was common. The sniggering briefly, uh, Scrub has up a a thing here, poetry by heart, which seems to oh, be no, something. No. Um, I, I, it's fine. Keep, keep, continue. Sorry, we we no. just have something to bring up uh, after you'd finished. That's all. Okay. Um, and then, of course, you have the the industrial age in which people are taught to read. But the problem is that teaching everybody in a society to read doesn't mean making everybody literate. I mean, I would <laughs> exactly. argue that, that now we live in one of the most illiterate ages ever known to man in terms of how detached everyone is from any kind of um, good or quality or culturally, um, re- sorry, culturally relevant uh, literature, even, even though everyone can, can read in the technical sense of the word. Um, so, you know, there was a brief period from sort of, I'd say, the late Victorian era up to the sort of 60s, 70s, maybe at a push, where you had what I would call a genuinely literate society in which, you know, um, someone like T.S. Eliot was able to, you know, be a sort of best selling poet and and have a wide influence. And, you know, all these people like Chesterton and, and Belloc and Shaw and all these sorts of people, H.G. Wells, back in the Edwardian era, who were genuinely read and appreciated by a large chunk of the population, both upper and lower. And I mean, one one example, I won't say too much on it now because we're gonna we're gonna talk about this later down, but um Chesterton's epic ballad, the 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 ballad of the White Horse, was extremely popular among soldiers in the First World War, just common soldiery who who took copies of the book to war with them, bought with their own money, and treasured them really, really treasured them they would ne- they were very very keen not to lose them and to always have, have have it with them you know that i think was the sort of brief golden twilight um in which you could have a society that hadn't yet been corrupted by the very industrialism it was it was proliferating but then you f- you fast forward to now of course when you know um all that kind of stuff has been destroyed as i said partly willfully by the regime in order to foster disconnect and confusion uh, but anyway sorry Oh no, it's fine. We would just—I would just want to have a quick look, actually. Uh, I've linked them in the in the uh, Discord bit as well about what what you get if you lock up what the um, the curriculum for poetry is in Britain. So this is kind of our starting point: the Education Hub, National Poetry Day, poetry on the curriculum. There's a lot of waffling here, but um, it says since 2013, the department has funded poetry by heart to deliver a national poetry recitation uh, competition. Uh, blah blah blah, but it says the bo- this, there is a body of evidence that suggests engaged with poetry can have benefits for mental health, cultural awareness, and and self expression. Your poetry will be therapeutic. <laughs> well, it's if you look at the the timeline of uh, of the anthology, and this is for the eleven plus I put up on screen here, but it's you get into the sixties and it's people like Louise Bennett Coverley. I don't know who that is. Colonization in reverse. I don't know who that is either, by the way. Um, <laughs> well, let's put it this way. She does look a bit like Aunt Jemima. Uh, Eloise Greenfield, who apparently wrote something about Harriet Tubman in 1978. What does this have yeah. to do with British poetry? But I, did, like, uh, I think did not some of the names stand out here, but there's others. There's like a Philip Larkin one, yeah. James mm-hmm. T. But then there's also like Gillian Clark, who I'm pretty sure is a feminist of one variety of another. I'm sure... If we were to dig into them more so, we would find that a lot of the ones I've got listed here are just 
paused through and through. Oh, I just like horrendous, like modern. I took a shit and clapped, and you must clap as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that kind of stuff. I don't know who Valerie Bloom is. Oh, there's one about Rosa Parks next to it. Yeah, Rosa Parks, Rita Dove. That important part I mean, of British culture, Rosa yeah. Parks. <laughs> Sassy black women talking about Rosa Parks. Yes. I mean, I will. I will go on a, a reactionary rant here. Um, and talk about the teaching of poetry in school because all this waffle about you know engaging and self expression I mean one poetry is not about self expression poetry is about essentially how imaginative a poet can be with language how inventive a poet can be with language as a tool because poetry specifically isn't like being a painter where you've got a huge range of kind of you know physical material to work with and a huge amount of choice in in what you actually make or or, or music where you know, you've got whole orchestras and, and, and kind of methods. You really, the, all a poet has is a piece of paper and a pen at the end of the day. That's, 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 all, that's all you've got to work with. So inventiveness is the, is the key virtue and the ability to hone, hone down language into something chosen and something, something beautiful that also seems effortless. So the, the idea that poetry is, 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 is like taking a shit, which is what we have now, has, been, has done more damage to the art form than practically anything else. You know. Where it's just, you know, oh, I'm sad about this, and oh, I'm sad about this, and oh, it's terrible. You know, the 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 result you get from that is what what are now called the Instagram poets. You know, the sort of uh, what's her name, Rupi Rupi Kaur, and this sort of thing, yeah. where it's just it's just talking about it's it's just platitudes about vaginas with line breaks. You know, it's not poetry, but that that's that is the logical end result of of using poetry as a, as a form of um, what shall I say? Re- sort of rectal clearance, you know. <laughs> that's mm. basically what it is. Well, yeah, that's you're exactly right because the the other end isn't sort of, uh, and dare I use the term, reductive sort of nonsense like that. It's just explicitly political. I mean, we're looking at one from some guy called Daljeet Nagra here, right. who's written now, some. I, I I don't mean to interrupt, but I will say, please keep this poem up on the screen while uh, Evelyn is talking because. I have a very specific bone to pick with this poem. Anyway, sorry, go on. But the, 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 you know, he's like, stowed to, stowed to st- in the sea to invade the alfresco lash of diesel breeze. He's basically talking about arriving... Migrants, yeah. Yeah, arriving migrants in the back of Bedford vans. I mean, if you scroll down here, what's the what's the bottom, second last one there? Yeah. Swarms of us grafting in, the black within the shot of the moons, spotlight banking on the miracle of the sun, span its rainbow... Passport us to life. Only then could it be human to hike ourselves barefaced for the clear. Ugh. Can I also point out the extremely cheap um, placement trick of making the, the the verses look like waves? Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yeah, they, they've, 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 they've done yeah. that. Yeah. He's he's so smart, guys. Now apparently it's basically a bastardization of another poem by a guy called Matthew Arnold, which is about uh, soldiers yeah. arriving after World War One, I, I believe. Yeah, and it's also yeah. about it's a melancholic uh, dialogue um, uh, of a civilized England imagining the withdrawal of religion from our shores and just sent into conflict and disorder. He thinks must follow, and this is basically hit this. Uh, Naj- Naljit Nagra going, ha ha, we've destroyed England and now we're all going to come here and laugh at you as we dance on its corpse. Because yeah. they've got this whole like thing at the side, which I would presume if you were to order this as part of the syllabus as a teacher, this is the stuff you would be told to talk about in class. Yeah, this is run this, by the government, this, by this, the way. This was on my syllabus. This yeah. was on my, my, my syllabus when I was in school. I, I, oh. I really, I mean, I, I, I wasn't, I mean, I guess I, I sort of instinctively always was, but I wasn't really that, you know, right wing or, or or sort of political back then. I was kind of mildly, mildly grumbly about things like it, like immigration. But this poem really got under my skin, you know, and at the time I didn't have the sort of um, the the grasp of, of literature that I could that I could sort of, you know, put it in its place. So I just sort of had to sit there and swallow it. I was I was. I was really, really just, just irritated to no end by this because it because it was just it's it's a song celebrating the destruction of one culture by the invaders, you know. Yes. Really. Yeah. Well I I think as well about uh you mentioned also a bad poem. <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. The prose is all <laughs> you mentioned being poem. at uh Wetan. 
uh, in summer of last year, and obviously I did my speech there on propaganda, and I I had this whole kind of wrap up thing at the end about you know the the first generation sort of northern working family who, or sorry, sorry the work northern working family who's just sent the first generation of theirs a sort of lot to university for the first time, mm. and then they come back and. You know, they, their heads been filled with all sorts of nonsense about how all Western literature is racist or something like that, and then yeah, this is yeah. perfectly modelled by sort of Maoist forms of propaganda. And then I see third paragraph there and explore the poem. Consider how the immigrants are described: stowed in the sea and hutched, they try to go under the radar. They are doing something dangerous, fearing a stab in the back or being caught in the spotlight of the moon. Niagara also uses the sort of metaphors employed insidiously by racists to whip up fear of immigration. He imagines that immigrants invade in dehumanised swarms. Yeah, it's basically you are being de-radicalised by bad poetry that is quite literally a celebration of the destruction of a previous England. It It's so explicit, is the thing. The fact that it's it's taken from Endover Beach by Matthew Arnold. Well, which- and it basically just says that it says, look, this poem has no regard for Britain. It is a parody of a previous era and a previous man who imagined the, the you know, what the death of religion would bring to these shores and the, and the violence that the lack of a of an inner spiritual life would do. And now he's talking, you know, he's he's cleverly quipping about the fact that a large part of the British population regard huge amount of immigrants invading as an invasion. And you you are meant again. It's just so steeped in everything, and it's it's it very much is kind of an example of poetry is so unpopular because it has just become a demonstration of hegemony. It's it's just a a tool of reinforcing what the regime is, and that's why people can't see beauty in it anymore, and that's why the shall public I, is basically disengaged from it. So yeah, shall I point out that 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 the awards that this this man has received involve um, an MBE. A fellowship of the Royal Society yeah. and various captured awards like the T. S. Eliot Prize, um, National Poetry Prize, um, the Costa Poetry Award, the Guardian First Book Award, you know. Or if you if you write a victory song for the regime as it tramples over the the, the, the native culture of its land, you will be fated, you know. <laughs> fated as a as a as, as a great bard, you know. It's it it's like that old cliche. Um when you know, some 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 barbarian king would take over a kingdom and then instruct all the poets to write endless songs praising him. You know, his <laughs> brave, glorious theme. It's that kind of thing. Nagra, sing me another verse about how Dover's amazing now that it's filled with huddled immigrants. Uh, yes, yes, yeah. uh, Chairman Sunak. <laughs> <laughs> but we should probably Good get on to to some of the examples since this is a not a moaning stream i was gonna say things can only get better yes things can only get better uh, as, well, I, as i want to i, I want to just add a little bit more about this because you know the the reason that they do the reason that they're that they're pushing um all of these kind of media i mean this is the thing that really gets me more than anything i suppose this is this is somewhat petty but it's not even just that they're pushing what is really foreign and quite caustic poetry onto the culture, a culture which has a, a deeply ingrained poetic tradition. And I mean, you know, England, Scotland and Wales, all in that. Um, it's, but it's, it's not even good poetry. Like, it's, it's, like this, this is a very bad poem that we're looking at here yeah. from a technical point of view. You know, objectively, there's nothing I can really praise about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I mentioned the, the cheap trick of the of the making the verses look like waves which seems designed for a kind of disinterested 14 year old gcse student to go this represents the dover sea as it comes onto the you know yeah it's it's <laughs> it's 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 pure, it's pure it's curriculum bait really you know uh, ri- definitely written with that in mind and it you know it, it's it's the fact that you know as i think this touches on the point about caroline duffy at the beginning it's not even that you're being taught foreign poetry per se. It's you're, you're being taught anti-poetry. Yes. You're, you're yeah. being taught something with the purpose of which is to snap your connection with the with the lifeblood of what came before you, really. 
It, it is, I think anti-poetry is a great way to describe it, and you're right, it's very much the waves represent the waves on the Dover beach, and also yeah, exactly. the waves of people coming to the border. Yeah. <laughs> I have read the syllabus. Yeah. yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Russell. Before we get on to the first poem, we do have the Geezer 30, who's uh, checked as a tenor. Evening folks, does Hat have an opinion on Algernon Charles Swinburne, also for the host and introduction to proper poetry in Swinburne's Lock Torridon, please do check it out. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't have like a, a just an opinion on him. I mean, you know, he was a very, very important poet. Um, you know, obviously, I, I read his work. I, I admire his works. He's, he's, he's not one of my personal, um, kind of favorites that springs to mind per se. But it's still, I still very much admire him. I mean, it's kind of like asking somebody, you know, well, what's, what's your opinion of? you know, Peter Paul Rubens as a painter, you know, it's like, well, you know, it, they, they obviously have an important place in the canon to use that controversial word, but I, I, I can't, I can't really say, Oh, I hate Swindon or oh, I love Sw- I Swindon, Swinburne. Um, I, I, I do hate Swindon. No, you um, must yeah. be decisive. There <laughs> can be Swindon. no indifference. Uh, I would All say he's, yeah, he's, a, he's a, he's a, he was a very great poet who, who deserves his, uh, his place. <laughs> Fair enough. Hmm. Um, I, I also will say want that this, to... yeah, that this this Sorry. poem deserves to be in the canon, but a canon you know aimed at the sun and then then probably <laughs> fired it out of it. Well, the thing is, I mean, I know that kind of the uh, the sort of classical liberal Sargon wing of the dissident right will cringe at this, but I'm fully in favor of just like burning regime books. Yeah, like, I would. <laughs> no, I'd be, I'd be perfectly not. happy for this to chuck this on a fire. Like this, you know, all the all the horrible like like semi literate like Afro poetry. We were forced to learn in school. Burn, just burn Tracy M into bed. Fire, clear them out. <laughs> okay. Ooga booga. You know. Wash chicken. Yeah, exactly. Ooga booga. <laughs> That's what well, I mean. It, this it is, is just a humiliation. Like, like, lo- lo- like you said, it's it's like I mean, we, we we were forced to do, you know, Benjamin Zephaniah. You know, we were we were, but we we were taught that he was like the greatest living poet, essentially. <laughs> you know, by these kind of by these kind of middle aged women teachers who you know probably have some sort of weird complex about hip hip men from the Caribbean. Um oh, no. I, I, oh, no. I, really, I, I, I really I really don't get it because again it's it's the, the poetry itself is technically appalling. Um you know it's the, these these people can't write poetry. They don't and the, the the worst thing is that the establishment and the media and all the various public bodies that would be a, a, that are meant to be judges of this kind of thing. They have no integrity. They're willing to give awful poetry awards because it fits the narrative, like the one we just we, we, we just looked at. It doesn't matter how bad the poem is, if it panders to them, if it flatters them, if it tells them what, what the kind of liberal, bleeding heart, hey on why visiting Guardian reading types who, who mediate all this want to hear, it will be lauded. Um, and I also just want to draw attention to someone called William Dudley in chat um, because they mentioned uh, the the... Uh, a former professor of poetry at Oxford, which is like an honorary p- position. It's a bit like being the laureate um, called Sir Geoffrey Hill. Um, and he, he, he mentions that he, the point he makes about poetry is not about self-expression. It's about expressiveness. And I, I basically, that's, that's who I derive that point from is uh, Sir Geoffrey Hill, who I recommend um, if people want, want a, um, a sturdier and kind of much more interesting and, and, and kind of, it's a, it's a creative um, introduction to poetry. Look up his uh, recorded lectures on on YouTube because he has a wonderful voice and a wonderful, I have to say, autism about words. You know, he was one of these people that owned owned a, an eighteen volume complete set of the Oxford English Dictionary. You know, and would and was 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 obsessed with the power and the and the kind of the the structures of the English language as something to be protected. You know, clear, clearly a man who who utterly was at odds with the society around him. Um, he he died in 2016, I think. Um, but uh, yes, an absolutely fan, fantastic poet, and um and a great lecturer. I'll just I'll just point that out before I forget. Anyway, so. that's fine. Um, I just wanted to say, what what is the first? Again, we're we're kind of doing a, a bit of an idiot's guide here, but I've called it the beginner's guide. Um, but where where would you start? Like you you've recommended a couple of poems to us, but where would you say people start with if they if they really are just lost and the only poems they've read is horrendous regime poetry in their GCSEs? 
What was um, his, the, the the starting point, the bottom floor? It's it's difficult because in a sense everybody responds slightly differently. Um, so I, I I can't really give a, a blanket answer, but something that does seem to resonate with people, um, especially in these circles, would be something like um, Rudyard Kipling, who is kind of one of these figures who is an entire subject unto himself. You know, he he wasn't just a poet. He wasn't just a writer. He was he was he was kind of the the defining face of the late 1800s, you know, and early early 1900s. The, the you know, there's, there's there's a reason that right now, as we speak, there are classrooms full of Indian academics somewhere in the subcontinent, you know, just discussing if if Kipling should should be remembered as an Indian poet or not, you know, this kind of thing. And I think because he 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 not only he not only had a connection with English history and kind of had and had the, the the talent of a writer to be able to speak for the English as a people, which he really does. If, if, the, if the English have ever had a voice in, in the last few centuries, it, it has to have been Kipling, I think. Um, and he 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 had this great intellectual connection to all these things and to what England was and what it might become. And he was able to to um, to create poems which are extraordinarily accessible because they they have a he has a real sense of meter and rhythm and he he really writes songs strictly speaking more than poems you know every time I open up um I've got I've got a lovely little book of Kipling poems and every time I open it up the urge is just to sing them out loud you know and I, I really think for people in this sphere that if I had to say here's where you start start with Kipling buy the um everyman library pocket poets edition it's a tiny little book but it's full of his best poems it's available on amazon for like you know eight pounds or something it's not it's not very expensive um and it fits in your back pocket you can take it anywhere and it's it's utterly remarkable and you know that you, you you can enjoy the poems on on a whole number of levels if you want to be really autistic about it you can really get into them and and see all these details if you if you just like a a good rolling rollicking rhyme then he's also best for it, you know. And I, I think Chesterton falls into that category as well. But the problem with him is that his poems are are not properly collected yet, really. Um, they're still a bit scattered. And to be fair, they do vary in quality in a way that I don't think Kipling does. I think Kipling was able to do sort of banger after banger. <laughs> yeah, you can um, get yes, the, that... uh, the hardcover version for about 10 quid, but it's so common you can get used versions for about a pound with like two quid delivery. So it is extremely yeah. available. I'll probably actually go and Very available. This, uh, after, after uh, <laughs> oh, awfully scattered. Oh, no. <laughs> no, it, no that, yeah. that poem is fantastic. The, the poems in that edition are fantastic. And they're, I mean, you know, Kipling is probably one of the most famous and widely read authors to have ever lived. So you can get, you know, old 1940s copies of his collected poems for, you know, two pounds in a secondhand bookshop and it'll have everything in it. You know, it, it just, just Kip, it, it's extraordinarily easy to get into Kipling. And I think that I can't really think of anybody in this sphere. I, I would include Americans in that too, because Kipling did actually have quite a strong connection to America. Um, I, I think that honestly, they, th there's no way they, they couldn't enjoy at least a couple of those poems, you know? Yeah. They, they're, they're, they're songs of an entire people, sometimes through the lens of a kind of comedic character, sometimes through the lens of just a common soldier serving somewhere in the empire. You know, um, just just re really, really, that, he, he is the way in for people in this sphere, I think. Fantastic. What I know about Kipling is he also quite heavily influenced. You mentioned the fact that he's very song-like. He's he's quite known for heavily influencing some of the kind of Chichi Miglin hymns written around the time as well. <clears throat> yeah, a, a lot of his work is like I want to say wholesale ripped off, but it, it it very much is that kind of work that is uh oh, that is is used for that kind of stuff. The fact that it's uh it, it's used in in terms of its songliness, it was very very influential. So that's uh yeah that's something. But I was I've linked the Amazon thing as well. Um, but it's it's good it's good to have like a starting point. I've got his encyclopedia. I also dramatica. I, I also encyclopedia like Britannica. <laughs> he doesn't have encyclopedia. Um, I I think it's also a good place to start because he will he will teach he will teach people a certain kind of nuance. I think that that 
unfortunately, not 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 through their own fault, but I think a lot of people do lack these days because he he has this kind of characteristic reputation, especially among kind of modern leftists, as this kind of empire tub thumper who just went, you know, empire good, empire good, everyone else bad sort of thing. But it's really not what he was like at all. I mean, even his most famous, you, you could argue it's a pro-empire poem, the, the white man's burden. Um, <laughs> it's actually a very, very nuanced poem that is really up to interpretation in, in a lot of ways. Um, you know, he, he, because it's, he, he wasn't a stupid man, and he, he definitely had a sense of where things were headed, even in the late sort of 1800s when everything seemed to be going well. He could, he could see that we were heading into an age of kind of bureaucracy and growing government and sort of looming tyranny. Um, and he's constantly warning about it, you know, and constantly um, warning um, the Britons to sort of watch where they tread and never become sort of arrogant um, about about their position in the world. Because when, when you're the world, I'm, I'm sure as, 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 as many Americans are beginning to realize, when you're the world hegemon, e- even if things are bad at home, really everything seems like it's going to be all right. You know, how could, how, how could you possibly lo- lose your position at the head of the world? But things can change very, very quickly. So, well, um, shall we get to some of the, Poetry you've picked out before we yeah, sorry, uh, run sorry. out of time. <laughs> not to not to upend you because the, the conversation is very interesting. I think. Oh no, I, I think it's I think we've got plenty of time really. Um, the the first poem you brought up, I believe. Would you like to go through the uh, ballad of the white horse or yes. the uh, the canto? I believe it is by Ezra Pound. I, I, I think it's the one you mentioned about um, usury, basically. So yes, well, I will. I'll start by. I'll start with the ballad of the white horse, um, because it's an important one. Because yes. it's, I mean, so so first of all, it's it's an it's an it's an Arthurian legend, basically, um, in the form of a poem, um, and it was written by G.K. Chesterton in 1911 after he went round and did a lot of research. Um, Although, as he says in the in the in the prefactory notes, it's not really meant to be historical. There are there are obvious liberties taken in terms of you know character and and what people were doing and such. But it's not really not meant to be about history. It's about it's about the struggle to maintain England as its inhabitants would like it. Um, and it's right. one of the things as well. But 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 for us, I think that is why it it it, it should be a more respected. Um, work, I think, on the on the right, because this it's obviously set at a time when the Danes uh, are invading England, and King Alfred is is struggling against them, but not doing particularly well. And this is symbolised by the the Uffington White Horse, which I'm sure everybody knows. You know, the the big white horse, which is carved into the into the side of a hill um, near 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 Uffington. Um, and uh, it, it's mentioned in the poem that that during the reign of the Danes in that area, it has become overgrown with weeds and shrubs and left to rot, really. Um, and uh, this this poem did come to mind during the uh, uh, degradations of early 2020, um, when somebody put some sort of, um, you know, BLM graffiti um, on the um, on the white horse, you know, which I think was quickly cleaned off, but still. It it struck me as a particularly low time for the for the British Isles, um, yes. as as mentioned in this poem. And now it's 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 an it, it's not it's not hugely long. It doesn't take long to read it. It's it's two thousand four hundred lines, which is not you know it's not some massive poetic tome sort of thing. Um, but it's it's as a poem goes, it's fairly long. So I, I don't have time to go through the whole lot of it and the story it tells. I just want to draw attention to a particular part at the end of book one. Um, in which Alfred, um, his armies are being scattered, his country is being ravaged and looted and laid low by the Danes, and he seems totally lost. He doesn't really know what to do. And he is visited by an apparition of the Virgin Mary. And at first, you, you first time you read this, you think, oh, here we go. You know, it's, it's going to be the classic, uh, you know, sort of deus ex machina or, you know, well, what is she going to do? Is she going to tell him that, you know, is, he, is she going to give him some prophecy or something? But instead, um, she, she, she chides him, first of all, um, and then tells him that it's actually not going to get better. Things are, might, things are actually going to get worse. Um, but I won't say any more yet. I'll just, I'll just read from, from the section. So um, it's a bit difficult because the standards aren't numbered. Um, but uh, I'll go from um, 
just the st- um the stands are above the one you've got there so it's where it says are written on the sky um oh, i'll go is. from i'll go from i think just one above that um let me see sorry get my own notes here pardon That's... me it's, <laughs> just, no, it's, it's just a giant, giant uh column of text on my screen for taking me taking me a sec to get it um so yes yeah, so i'll go from um so yes, he 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 sees the, the Virgin Mary, and he says, "Mother of God," the wanderer said, "I am but a common king, nor will I ask what saints may ask to see a secret thing. The gates of heaven are fearful gates, worse than the gates of hell. Not I would break the splendors barred or seek to know the thing they guard, which is too good to tell. But for this earth most pitiful, this little land I know, if that which is forever is, or if our hearts shall break with bliss, seeing the stranger go." When our last bow is broken, Queen, and our last javelin cast, under some sad green evening sky, holding a ruined cross on high, under warm westland grass to lie, shall we come home at last? And a voice came, human but high up, like a cottage climbed among the clouds, or a surf of hut and croft, that sits by his hovel, fire is oft, but hears on his old bare roof aloft a belfry burst in song. And this is the Virgin Mary speaking now, she says, The gates of heaven are lightly locked. We do not guard our gain. The heaviest hind may easily come silent and suddenly upon me in a lane. And any little maid that walks in good thoughts apart may break the guard of the three kings and see the dear and dreadful things I hid within my heart. The meanest man in gray fields gone behind the set of sun heareth between the heareth between star and other star through the door of darkness fallen ajar. The council eldest of the things that are the talk of the three in one. The gates of heaven are lightly locked. We do not guard our gold. Men may uproot where worlds begin or read the name of the nameless sin. But if he fail or if he win, to no good man is told. The men of the east may spell the stars and times and triumphs mark. But the men signed of the cross of Christ go gaily in the dark. The men of the east may search the scrolls for sure fates and fame. But the men that drink the blood of God go singing to their shame. The wise men know what wicked things are written on the sky. They trim sad lamps, they touch sad strings, hearing the heavy purple wings, where the forgotten seraph kings still plot how God shall die. The wise men know all evil things under the twisted trees, where the perverse in pleasure pine, and men are weary of green wine and sick of crimson seas. But all, but you and all the kind of Christ are ignorant and brave, and you have wars you hardly win, and souls you hardly save. I tell you naught for your comfort, yea, naught for your desire, save that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher. Night shall thrice night over you, and heaven and iron cope. Do you have joy without a cause, yea, faith without a hope? So that just that section there I wanted to read, because it stands out as one of the ultimate kind of unexpected moments in this style of English poetry. Because this divine figure appears in the midst of a struggle and says, buck up your ideas because it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse before things improve, really. Um, and it's, it just strikes me as so relevant to, you know, where we are now, even even down to the, co- the, co- the coincidences of words like cope, as pointed out in the chat. <laughs> you know, the cope. Um, it's it's, it's that, that, that specific line, I tell you naught for your comfort not for your desire but the 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 sea that the sky grows darker yet and the sea rises higher it's a very powerful couple of lines just you know and in i mean this is a this um is a difficult example um obviously with this kind of crowd but because i I know the second world war isn't exactly um uh, we we don't exactly accept the mainstream narrative um but if, if 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 you forget the sort of uh the sides for a second I think a particularly poignant poignant moment of this was um, right after um, uh, Crete was taken by the Axis forces in the Second World War, mm. and it was seen as a particularly low moment, and everything seems to be going wrong for Britain, um, and the war seemed almost kind of hopeless at that point. And to, on on that particular day, the headline of the Times, the <laughs> the Times newspaper. In, in, instead of a kind of leading front front page, it was just replaced with this verse. That's all they had. It was just this. I different, mean, different times. Different times. Yeah, exactly. different Britain. 
doesn't doesn't that speak to the fact that you had a people who could who you could basically turn to and go it's bad yeah, and I... they they wouldn't because i mean now all, all anyone is used to is constantly being told that everything is good and everyone's everyone's winning all the time you know yeah, but i would say in that kind of sense as well there's almost maybe i'm completely wrong on this and that's not to say that there isn't there wasn't any point a tradition of tragedy, but I almost get a a hint of almost like self awareness from this. It's yes. sort of in the same way that Carlisle in certain places seems kind of out of place because he has taken something that, you know, for him was the norm and, you know, the eighteen sixties or the eighteen seventies at that period, but it seemed absurd to him. And he decided to show the absurdity through, you know, blowing it up twenty fold so that it seemed like utter nonsense. It would have been completely ridiculous at the time to read it. But now looking back on what he's written, it feels like he's writing it for us. Yeah. Because he's showing how something, you know, a century and a half ago that got took as a norm became something that we now understand as this sort of absurd fallacy of liberal democracy or whatever it is. I get a similar sort of sense mm-hmm. here. I I just like to point out also how incredibly metal some parts of oh, these it was are. The, it was the uh, what was that the the drinking blood of gods or whatever. Else. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> but the men yeah. that drink the blood of God go singing to their shame. It just says where the forgotten seraph king still plot how God shall die. The wise men all know evil things under the twisted trees. It's so much <laughs> better though than something like some pithy social commentary thing yeah. on like exactly. oh here's here's why the left aren't tolerant it's like no here are the real problems in the world and we will describe them through the language of glory and greatness yeah, and it's, true it's, tragedy it's such a thing it's just exactly. like i'm i'm gonna talk about in in like childish form in these really hackneyed waves about immigrants breathing diesel fumes and like G.K. Chesterton's here, and I'm like, I'm talking about how fallen angels plot the death of the Lord. <laughs> exactly. It's it's this is a a big um a big thing I think is is that you know I'm always telling people who are into the arts or into poetry or literature on on the dissident right is for God's sake, don't write quote based poems. Don't make don't make based art as such. Just get to the heart of the matter in the most powerful and inventive way you possibly can. Yeah, truly like, good art will be based by default. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. You do, It's not something you have to consciously work in. It's something that will become apparent if the work is good enough. Yeah, the, 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 the best art kind of interfaces with our amplified reality and reality is based. No, Michelangelo painted the roof of the Sistine Chapel and thought, oh my god, people are going to put so many trad fucking montages of this on Twitter, bro. I'm going to get mad clout. Exactly. Just, don't, the, don't pander, you know. The scale here is so epic, like unapologetically epic, though. Yeah. It's it's almost oh. like kind of a, almost like a poetry version of Wagner. It, it is anti-modern yeah. in every sense. Yes, I mean, this is yes. something me and you were talking about for different reasons earlier on this evening, that if we were to be honest with ourselves and we really put forward what we see as a positive vision yeah. in plain English, it would be illegal. It would be seen as some form of radical manifesto and it would be banned. Yeah. However, I wonder if, you know, Harking back to heroic and epic traditions of poetry might be a way where you can actually deal with the seriousness, the real sort of demonstration of political will yeah. in the world, and some of the, shall we say, the return of history in a certain sense could actually mm-hmm. maybe be dealt with in poetry without you getting arrested instantly. Absolutely, I think I think that genuinely is the way forward. Is to and I, I've I've been saying this for a while. The the dissident right needs to cultivate some kind of academy of its own, whether it's informal or formal, mm. that is capable of helping young artists hone their skills to really be the top of their game, to be able to produce works like this. Things that things that aren't you know based in the short term sense. Things that aren't just going to look you know, horribly out of date in, in two months. Mm. But things that really get to the heart of the matters that we're dealing with. Well, you know. This is like this this poem, it's it's all about 
it's all about triumph in the face of the absolute worst adversity when your country is being overrun and trashed by foreigners. You know, I failed to see how there could be a more relevant piece of art to us today. <laughs> no, exactly. You can you can then be the uh, cheer of the poetry possession and the yeah. uh, Gotha and, you know, Chester and Sweet at the Carlisle Institute when that's all set up. <laughs> I relish the day. I relish the day it comes, but yes. <laughs> uh, well, to get to it as well, the second one, uh, the second poem you brought forth uh, to us yes. is a piece by Ezra Pound. If I get spicy. Yes. yes. Um, well, I I, ha- I have to put this one in because I'm, I I admit I am pandering. It's it, it's a crowd favourite for obvious <laughs> reasons. Um, and obviously it's part of the cantos, which were a, a kind of large um, um, series of poems by Ezra Pound that are collated together. Um, I just want to ask, how much time do we have left to go? Um, oh, just to judge. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm that's to say. Okay, I'll um I'll I'll I'll, I'll say what I was going to say then. So it's so. Ezra Pound um, is part of a particular group of, of poets. I would, I would put Eliot in there with them, the American poet Robinson Jeffers, all these and all these various kind of poets, perhaps D.H. Lawrence as well, who were actually deeply reactionary people, um, or at least deeply upset with liberal democratic consumerist society and sought radical solutions to it. Um, and because they were poets, because they were they were writers, they consciously kind of crafted a modernist um, aesthetic, and they they broke with traditions in order to preserve them. If that makes sense. Um, yes. And I think a, a great problem and a, a great one of the great sad ironies of the last hundred years is that modernism and postmodernism and all the things that came after were basically just used as, as, as acid to pour on what was left of, of Western, uh, Western art. But it was, it, it was formulated by people that were deeply reactionary and, and wanted to regenerate Western society back into something great. Um, no, I very much I and, think uh, of Wyndham Lewis, who was, of course, an associate yeah. of Ezra Pound at the time, I believe. You know, he, yes. he engaged in reactionary thought through things like rejections of democracy, rejections of consumerism, even then really small stuff like rejecting the notion of the sort of plebeian holiday. Yeah. That you know, the the, mm-hmm. the travelling in and of itself had through technology and you know, the fact that we'd made all these different states safe through the empire, that it became just a kind of novelty that people did on a long weekend. Yeah. And that in that same sense he was essentially disregarded because his reactionary sort of political views were expressed through Sor- Sorel and syndicalism, which are now these old mm-hmm. dead ideas. And if anyone talks about syndicalism, they'll maybe mention the fact that, like, oh, well, isn't that what Mussolini used to read? And it's all old and fuddy duddy. But mm-hmm. I thought we were an autonomous collective. Yes. But within. You know, as as I'd imagine from you find from Pound's poetry within Wyndham Lewis's stuff that isn't even necessarily his fiction writing, which I suppose is probably dripping in the same themes as well. It's just not my forte. But in his non-fiction stuff, like the art of being ruled, through and through, there's reactionary themes that we should really go back and pick up on. But as you said, because they are associated with modernism and consequently postmodernism, and people will just think that they are some you know, connection to the Fabians or this or that group of the mm-hmm. Tory party during the interwar period. It's, well, oh, well, it's all guff. So, well, no, because they are going to great lengths to look on back, look back on the things that we too are doing the same with. And even that in and of itself should be of interest to us. Um, yes, absolutely. And I think it's also important to remember that the modernists as a whole were really at the, at the face of a struggle against what they saw as a rotten society. Um, and when somebody is fighting a war, when somebody is in battle, they may do things that you don't necessarily approve of in normal times. You know, they will, they will act in ways that, you, that maybe you wouldn't expect, or they might be a bit caustic to talk to, you know. Um, so that's what people have to keep in mind. I mean, they, they, they weren't... Remember that, that these, these people weren't, you know, like modern right-wing Twitter accounts. You know, they 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 weren't there to just produce sort of based sound bites. They were they were trying to 
kick Western society back into gear via the medium of art. Mm. Um, and it's something that, you know, maybe we could say, well, they ended up failing, but they still produced a great number of great works, you know. Um, the the I mean, I, I did a stream with um, John Dee on AA's channel last year about um, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot. And, you know, he also did the four quartets and these kind of these kind of great philosophical meditations on on what had ha what had become of of Western society and, and how it had kind of lost its lost its center, you know, um, and how everything seemed to be falling apart. To use that line of Yates. But anyway, um, let's move on to this um, Ezra Pound canto. Um, and I want to just point out at the end there is a note that Ezra Pound has helpfully left in, which will be of interest mm -hmm. to the economically minded. Um, yes which says usury, a charge for the use of purchasing power levied without regard to production, often without regard to the possibilities of production, hence the failure of the Medici bank. Um, I know that you two are far more economically well-read than I am. I don't know if you can provide any extra context there. Uh, um, he's, he's basically talking about the irresponsible use of uh, finance without any further repercussion as to whether or not that finance itself is used for any uh, great use, as it were. They are, yeah. you know, he's, he's sort of saying that the, maybe we'll, we'll get more of a feel of this during the poem itself, but that usury generally, in his view that he's talking about here, is funding consumption, not production. Yeah, it's, it's also yeah. talking about the fact that it's, you know, corrosive, leads to collapse, leads to things not being produced. It's it's generally uh, his tone here is that it's parasitic, even this little note. Well, also the fact that hence the failure of the Medici Bank. That's <laughs> him basically going like proto Rothschild stuff, which I know uh, Ezra Pound has some interesting things to say. If I remember correctly, he may have been involved in the early English mystery group that got the protocols of Zion printed in the twenties in the UK press. Mm -hmm. I think I don't know if he was involved with that, but he was involved with um, social credit um, mm. and the, the the attempts to build an economic system independent of um, financial speculation, especially in the wake of the Great Depression. Um, and that's that's why he ended up in Rome um, and did broadcasts on behalf of Mussolini, um, <laughs> because he saw the Axis cause as a crusade against um, a certain economic way of life dominated by a certain ethnicity um and i won't say any more than that um well, no, we, that's, we, that's, we literally have the... a, i guess we literally have a poem on screen about usury so i don't think we need yeah. to say much well, else it's, <laughs> it's interesting though because i've been reading uh Ber is it bernard deet's book neo tories which is a sort of investigation of the more loyalist hardcore sect of the conservative party during 1929 to 1939 and there, are, there was constant reference to Ezra Pound and all these different reading and study groups. They had like this large one that went on for years. It was like a, a study group on the corporatist economy, or as you're describing, the sort of Italian uh, early fascist economy and all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. there is there was definitely very much a lot of links that went back then. And it's interesting to see that, as you're saying, these, these people who were part of the modernist art scene were very much influential people within society and also within the conservative movement in the UK and even further just within the conservative party itself yes um yeah he he was he was really somebody who wanted to totally reimagine western society um in that sense he he was he was he wasn't just somebody who wrote wrote poetry as such um in fact some some would say somewhat controversially that um and I I have thoughts on this that I'll get to another time, but some would say he was actually a better critic of poetry and a, and, a, and a better writer about poetry than a, than a poet himself. Um, but anyway, I also just want to provide this poem because it's a it's a good example to prove to people on the dissident right who who have this obsession with form, you know, where somebody will see a painting that was that was you know is 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 modernist in some way. And they'll go, oh, cringe, and then and then they'll 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 retweet some some Twitter account called you know Trad Western Art, which <laughs> exclusively posts like eighteen nineties academic style 
paintings of 17 year old girls you know yes. um <laughs> I kind of exactly think. what you're it, talking about roman towel it's, boys it, yes yeah yeah it's it's it, it's it's a great it's a great um tragic misunderstanding of art and you know that, i, I don't want to get statue now, but... feel something yeah exactly look at the roman statue it's it's un- unless it's a roman statue or a french a- academic work from 1890 e- everything in between that ignored <laughs> But only those two things are considered trad to the initial. I don't know why, but it's sad because, you know, if you have a movement claiming to be standing for Western civilization and then you can't, you don't have any real grasp of, of Western art or, or Western style, you know, like, again, for, like form is, is less important than, than, the, than the basic content of the work from, from this perspective. You know, this is, a, this is a poem using very little in the way of poetic conventions. It's not rhymed. It's not really metered um and it, and it jumps all over the place but the message is very powerful because it's like a kind of meditative hymn you know but the the point is it it, it can be a great poet a great poem and it doesn't have to rely on traditional form and I, i'm somebody who who is um a great devotee of form in poetry but i don't think you should be limited to it i do think that you should take advantage of the 20th century if you like um to Plus the entire you know, kind of experiment. Uh, the remit of uh, postmodern traditionalism. Yeah, exactly, ancient, exactly. Ancient uh, methods and values uh, reinforced through modern Machiavellian methods. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyway, I'm going to have a go at reading it. Um, I will warn people: it's it's chock full of um, words in for- in foreign languages and foreign names. I will probably bugger them up terribly. Um, but nevertheless, I will try. And also, I I can't hold a candle to the Ezra Pound reading of the poem because he 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 he, he had a voice and a way of, of singing poems that I really can't do. But anyway, <clears throat> Usura. With Usura hath no man a house of good stone, each block cut smooth and well fitting, that design might cover their face. With Usura hath no man a painted paradise on his church wall, harpes at Luth or where virgin receiveth message and halo protects, projects from incision. With Uzura seeth no man, Gonfaga his heirs and his concubines. No picture is made to endure, nor to live with, but is made to sell, and sell quickly. With Uzura, sin against nature, is thy bread evermore of stale rags, is thy bread dry as paper, with no mountain wheat, no strong flour. With Uzura the line grows thick, with Uzura is no clear demarcation and no man can find sight for his dwelling. Stonecutter is kept from stone, weaver is kept from his loom. With Uzura, wool comes not to market, sheep bringeth no gain with Uzura. Uzura is a murrain, Usura blunteth the needle in the maid's hand and stoppeth the spinner's cutting. Pietro Lombardo came not by Usura, Duccio came not by Uzura, nor Pia della Francesca, Zwan Bellin not by Uzura, nor was La Cal- Calunia painted. Came not by Uzura Angelico. Came not Ambrogio Praedis. Came no church of cut stone side, Adamo me fesit. Not Uzura by San Trofim. Not by Uzura Saint Hilaire. Uzura rusteth the chisel. It rusteth the craft and the craftsman. It gnaweth the thread in the loom. None learneth to weave gold in her pattern. Azure hath a canker by Uzura. Cramoisi is embroidered, emerald findeth no memling. Uzura slayeth the child in the womb, it stayeth the young man's courting, it, has, it hath brought palsy to bed, lieth between the young bride and the bridegroom, contra naturam. They have brought whores for Eleusis. Corpses are set to banquet at behest of Uzura. So there you go. <laughs> A very good reading. Um, it's very clear what he means by... A lot of what he's saying is he's based mm-hmm. on saying that you know money men, especially money lenders with interest, don't don't make art. In fact, they corrode it. They corrode oh, production. They the, corrode everything. There is mm-hmm. there is an element of Carlyle. I would imagine this must be in some way inspired by him because it's. I'm reminded of him, you know, writing in full capital letters like yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, cursed yeah. mammon, cursed <laughs> mammonism, and then he will go on a rant for like three pages about how. Because there is mammonism, there is an obsession with money and there's, wealth and material. There's something of literally the, uh, everything is ruined. Yeah. The crafts are ruined, the arts are ruined, 
even the sausages are ruined by mealy mouthed men like exactly. Bobus, Bobus Higgins, the yeah. sausage maker. <laughs> I, I always I always think of this poem when thinking about goy slop and you know all the. <laughs> it, the it is. Food. It is. You know, it's goy slop and easy bread, trainers. By bread dry as paper, no mountain wheat, no flour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very azure bringeth forth the soy. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it it does. I mean, you know, it's it, it's. I I agree with your point about Carlyle, and I I think that Ezra Pound and Thomas Carlyle had very similar personalities in in terms of a kind of great unrest um, with the way things were going, and and this 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 need to kind of scream from the top of the bell tower, you know, at, at what, what was happening. That there, there there definitely is a some kind of connection between the two you see in the work. I mean, e- even when he's writing prose um, essays, Ezra Pound does that kind of Carlylean thing with the capitals, you know, where he says, you know, don't do this and don't do that and make sure we do, you know, always, always kind of stressing things and ranting and, you know, always kind of high energy, whatever he does, yeah. which I think it's is the, good. Uh, it's the sham. Never boring. Yes, it Thomas is. Seven, yeah, seven, exactly. I was going to say, it, it is very Thomas 777. If seven, only seven. there was a few, like, uh, death to Ukraine, 788. <laughs> well, well, basically the, uh... him saying, uh, you know, contra natural, you know, counters nature, usury is unnatural, you know, it slayeth the, uh, the young man's courting, it slayeth the child in the womb. I mean, it's all very... Very prophetic. Our corpses are set to banquet. That's the one that got me. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's, it's 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 very. There are very obvious connections with the modern world, aren't there? With yes. everything that we're living through, you know. He's basically d- describing in prose the corrosive effect of like modern global finance. You know, yes. the, the the there's there's no craftsman. The the chisel rusteth. The, uh, we don't we don't make anything anymore. <laughs> yeah, it ignores just, the thread from the loom. No one has any skills. He's he's, he's it, basically just describing that. It it really speaks to me the the parts about you know the 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 everything being robbed of everything else because all I think about whenever I look at any kind of news or or read about any of this the, all the the kind of money markets that that drive this country it's like none of this is real. This is all just like none, none of this exists. This is this is all just like numbers on a screen. You know, it's all it's all hypothetical until it actually hits you and turns out. Of course, it always just gets worse. You know, yes. essentially, it's not real until. Oh yeah, by the way, it's going to get worse again. You oh, no, know, yeah, because exactly. that's just it's it's not real until it's an excuse for more money to be pilfered from us. Yes, terrible. Uh, I mean, when, when was this written? By the way, I've I've just. Uh... Just um, it's, well, the, the cantos were written between a, you know about forty years. I um, I'll have to look it up specifically. Uh, where... I'll do some some quick some quick live researching here. Um, so it looks like it was written sometime in the nineteen thirties. Yes, nineteen thirty seven. Yep, thirty seven. A, a good year, a good vintage. Um, <laughs> this, <laughs> this kind of thing. I I don't imagine that poem could be written post nineteen forty five. Put it that way. I, um, I... N- no, but it is one of his more popular poems. Yes. Um, so it it, ha- it has. I mean, the the fascinating thing about all these people, you know, T. S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Wyndham Lewis, is that the academy and the regime can't let them go because they're they're too they're just too important. You know that you 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 can't just skip over them and go. Oh, they were a bunch of fascists. You know, we won't talk about them because then you wouldn't have anything to stand on. You know, if you're if even, you know, e- even now, um, if you're going to do a, a degree in English literature or something, you will have to encounter these people at some point. You'll have you 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 can't forget that that that, that T. S. Eliot existed. You know, sort of thing. It, Ezra Pound had such an influence on art in that century, and such an influence on the people around him that you can't ever forget his name or the things he wrote. E- even if even if you're you know even if you're utterly beholden to the ideas ideas of the current regime you you can't you, you just you, you can't ignore these people they're, they're they're places too great you know um well let's, let's have so a look they're, if you, they're if in a weird the, irony if you go to the 1930s here what do they do they even have ezra pound they do have a hilarious block one all oh, right dh lawrence as well wyb yates i'm sure well, that one's the, the, uh, the european jungle Yes. <laughs> well, this is this this is the strange thing because the the regime doesn't 
ignore them. It doesn't unperson them. But I think, like Bowden said, you don't have to ban books when 40% of the population can't read them anyway. Well, yeah. The, yeah. I would mm-hmm. imagine that there are many a university class where that Ezra Pound poem is read and the connection yeah. is not a discussion on finance specifically, but about capitalism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About they... consumerism. Yeah. And it will be quoted upon layer and layer of Marxist framing. I mean, I, I've made the point so many times, and I might as well make it here as well, that, you know, we see nowadays, uh, what's his face? Calvin Robinson running around for GB News. Look at me, I'm the based mm-hmm. mulatto. But also, Enoch Powell was a sevener. Yeah, and it's now that you can yeah. recognize Enoch Powell, and you can recognize Enoch Powell as an opponent to immigration, but what you can't recognize him as, as someone who believed in an exclusive British identity based on ethnicity. Yes, yes, and I think the other, um, the other great problem is that all of the university academics that are being trained to go through this stuff and to to kind of be the custodians of it are they have no independent agency they are they are they are utterly deracinated fungible people who who just exist in the university space they 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 do nothing of consequence they 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 produce nothing and they don't really have any connection with this to to them it's just a job to them it's just something they have to write essays about to get paid you know other academics Um, are going to buy it so it doesn't need to be marketed yeah well, exactly. And the, the other thing is as well that, just, just to, to follow up your point there, a lot of this comes down to, you know, basically Derrida and the kind of the whole structuralist thing where the author doesn't exist, there's only a text, you know? So if, if, you, would, if you had been in 1930 and tried to argue that Shakespeare was talking about, you know, um, uh, I don't know, uh, homosexuality and um, the rise of fascism. They would have said, "Well, obviously not, because that obviously isn't apparent, and the other thing does didn't exist in his time." But yeah. post the sixties, you can do that because there is only the text and your interpretation of it. The author mm-hmm. doesn't matter. The author is dead. The author is a dead white male with reactionary opinions who can be disregarded as a as a as, as a stooge and an idiot. You know, all you have is their text, and you can interpret whatever you want from that. That that is the real legacy of the post-war academic era, and it's why they can kind of uh, they can kind of lubricate these things so that you can you can take somebody like Carlyle or Wyndham Lewis and almost almost just look at them neutrally and kind of kind of disregard them um, and look at them through purely purely sort of non-harmful non-harmful lenses. Yes, I'm reminded um, of the. Oh, it's the Jonathan Bowden lecture on the new left, and he's talking about you know, desacralize, depersonalize, yeah. detach, and then basically destroy. Well, that's how they try and teach Schmidt. In like, if you if you do a degree like a proper political science degree that still exists at like Oxford or Cambridge, they have mm-hmm. to teach you Schmidt. But they 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 do it in such a way that they try and make like neutral liberal position Schmidt and it completely destroys any kind of impact it would have or what he's actually trying to say. I, I actually can't Ooh. believe that I read a certain Canadian man's Twitter feed the other day and he literally said, going to use reactionary thinkers to bolster my understanding of liberal democracy. <laughs> Which is word for word like the the heading from the challenge of Carl Schmidt that has essays from like Slavoj Zizek and about literally how they're going to use the friend enemy distinction to reinforce a liberal democratic framing when those people themselves are like weird socialists of some variety. Yes. It's great. <laughs> I mean, I um, I did English literature at the um, sixth form level, and it was just people being encouraged to have any take they wanted on any text. So, you know, there there were there were these kind of utterly dull sort of pretentious um, sort of lefty types who wanted to talk about how, you know, the proto-feminism and Shakespeare and all this kind of thing. Um, and they could do it. You know, there was, there was no resistance to that. It was just, that, that was just, that's, that's what, that's what good academia is now. 
Mm. Well, yeah, as soon as you um, smash kind of the, the sort of taboo of treating both the work and the writer behind it with any semblance of respect, it's fair game not just to reinterpret it, but you're actually almost incentivized to come up with the most novel, the most extreme, and the most radical new interpretation. Yeah, the, the text belongs to you, and you stand out by destroying it as much as possible. Yes. 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 It's... um. It, I mean, it's 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 absolutely of a, a travesty. I mean, um, some somebody in chat has has um, wondered about um, the fact that now um, academia is just a job, um, and I think I think there is something something to that because prior to the modern age, you basically had works which were you know known throughout the the whole of the society. I mean even in ages where most people couldn't read. I, I know that, for example, one of the reasons that um, Don, Don Quixote became such a popular work throughout all of Europe was because it would be read aloud in taverns in the evening, you know? Like, it was, it was sort of like going to, watch a, well, going to watch a sitcom, an episode of a sitcom, you know? They would, somebody would stand up in the pub in Spain or wherever, and they would read a chapter of Don Quixote, and everyone mm. would sort of laugh and enjoy it. And it would it will be part of the entertainment in, in 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 the in the same way that Shakespeare's plays the majority of people that saw those plays weren't you know elites with with an education in the arts they were just plebs who paid a shilling to come and see a play you know um, because but but you know not only is Shakespeare one of the greatest you know kind of uh, poet philosophers come playwrights who ever lived but he was able to communicate to a, an audience of Englishmen. Mm. Really, it's just average Englishman who you know you you didn't you didn't need a specific spe uh, specific requirement to understand it, um, and that that's how these things would pass into common memory. You know, until until not long ago, it was still very common for you know you could go to a, a some sort of you know working class estate in in Manchester or something. There would be people there who still remembered huge chunks of poetry and of, and of Shakespeare plays from when they were in school. You know, I mean, this, this is a point I actually meant to make um, earlier on when we were talking about the, the, the um, curriculum, is that when you go back to, say, the Victorian style of teaching, which wasn't, per well, wasn't perfect, but, but one of the hallmarks of that was that children would be forced to learn poetry by heart. They would have to, they, in order to pass that particular class, you would have to learn certain poems. And what, what this did is it, it, it kind of was an honest way of, of teaching because some kid might not be emotionally mature enough to understand all these, all these poems that people have written in his language. But if you make him learn it, one day he will get mature enough or have an experience where all of a sudden it'll make sense. He'll, he'll understand what these, all these poets are talking about, you know, in some way. And it'll be there ready for him. It'll be in his head. You know the, the 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 lines will come forth. the 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 power of it, the the explanatory, sort of cathartic power of great English poetry, will then be realised. Whereas now, you know, I mean, we 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 read that whole thing about uh, you know we're going to teach people how to be appreciative and and how to be self expressive. And it's just waffle. None of that means anything. You know, you you either engage with the great pieces of poetry that your ancestors have given you, or you're forcibly detached from it. And right now we have the latter. And, you know, you know, it's, well, you know, which, which one do you want? Oh, well, very, very powerful words, I think. Is there anything else you want to say before I do kind of our closing shilling? Or... Um, mm. Well, I would, I would recommend everybody buy the um, Imperium Anthology. Um, it's, I mean... I'm somebody who has a huge amount of, of books on poetry and I find it very useful um, because we, we haven't just put in all the old favorites. You know, there are, there are ones in there that um, you won't have seen before. I promise um, that I think that I think um, deserve some light. And um, it's just a very well edited book and it's very well, well put together. I'm, I'm not praising myself there. I'm praising the people that literally put it together. I'm talking about the, the, the people that actually set, set the physical book up. Um, it's extremely well done. It's, it's crammed a lot into a very small space in a very effective way. Um, and it will be good to see people, people using it. And also I will add that I don't get uh, any, any royalties for it. Um, I was, I was given a fee to, to write the introduction and that's it. So 
Um, this is this is not me shilling something that I will I will make money off. Oh no, um, I, I think it's just, yes, yeah. it's good. It's a good thing to have. And you've you've mentioned other books. I put them in the chat. I'll put a pinned yes. comment later, basically with the links to the poems and the links to the book. Which is already in the description, and a link to a couple of the you know the other book you mentioned as well. Um, I will say that you are still on social media, just about. Um, yep. You are on. <laughs> you're on Twitter. You you are still kind of on YouTube, although I know, I know you've been very busy recently. But I'll, I'll put those two in there if people do want to follow yeah, you. I will. I will be making videos again very soon. In fact, I'm I'm working on one tonight after the stream. Um, and uh, I will just add as well. I know that there are kind of there are some um, there are some people um, in in these circles in general who kind of have a, a sneer in it. They go, "Well, poetry is not really for me." You know, it's all a bit all a bit arty or whatever. And I just want to say, remember the point that was made at the beginning. Poetry isn't just some diversion to occupy time. The reason that you that you don't appreciate it or can't is because you have been forcibly detached from it, and the, the 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 regime has succeeded in separating you from the literally from the lifeblood of the people you come from and it's i think it's really your duty to try and reconnect that link because if you don't you're giving up ground to the regime i think far too many on the right are willing to just give up the arts you know whatever let 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 the left have all the books and all all, all the music and all the paintings and all the sculptures or whatever don't do that never give up ground to the enemy if you can avoid it you know engage with this to engage with these things that that you know that make the people of this country the, the people that the, the english speaking peoples to use that phrase that add that that extra level of, of greatness because of the achievements you know people like shakespeare and and various other poets they're ge they're genuinely some of the greatest imaginative people to have ever lived that's that's why they're they're teaching him now in classrooms in brazil and Nigeria and India and, and, and China, you know, that it's because we we have in this country one of the greatest dramatic and poetic traditions that has ever been seen. And for God's sake, don't let don't let them take that away from you. That would be the, that would be what I would end Words on. Words to live by. Yes. If uh, uh, and if you wish to cash in on such a such an attitude make sure you're present for a uh, nomos manchester 2 in partnership with the mises institute yes on the 27th of may this year i believe we've sold over a third of the tickets now by a decent margin yes uh, and... we we, I, we can't really announce in what specific capacity but i will say there is an extremely good chance that uh that mr hat will be there in some yes. capacity so I'm I, I will, yes even even if I'm not speaking you can you can you can well, join we, me at the bar. Um, we don't have someone to uh, handle proceedings for this evening, so I might actually just ask you right now: Would you like to be our be MC? <laughs> I would love to be the MC. I would I would relish that opportunity. Well, there you go. Hopefully, no. there's a few folk buy tickets now because oh, more Panama hat. Yeah, Woo! yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is good. Um, we do have you know we have No Moss Two. It's happening on the twenty seventh of May. And tickets start at about thirty-five pounds. If I if I flash it up here for people, um, it's 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 going to be good. We've already sold quite a lot of the tickets, and we haven't made many of the announcements yet. Uh, so do get in if you can. Uh, for those of you who would like to follow our writing, we do have the anti-politics Substack, as mentioned at the beginning. Uh, if you guys want to keep seeing this kind of content, do drop a like, do subscribe, and do comment. I know it's gay to say all that stuff. Uh, do the algorithm. Yeah, the, I'm afraid the algorithm not. gods do need appeasing <laughs> in some way. Uh, we are still monetized. So the best recurring way you can support us inside the the ecosystem is through um, is through membership channel membership, which we do have available. Although I am trying to work on a decent kind of recurring way for people to support us that isn't something like subscribe style, which I find very clunky and has very limited payout windows. Uh, I don't want people to essentially waste their money on fees and be in escrow where, you know, we can't really access it. Um, so I'll, I'll try and work on some stuff for people because people have expressed quite a lot of desire to help support us in, in different ways, but have expressed a bit of, you know, disdain for the large cuts that certain services take, which is, uh, which is fine. I understand. Your, uh, <laughs> I, do, I do understand your frustration because I share it. Um, we'll be back on Wednesday with the second part of our Ofcom stream. We did kind of a history of Ofcom last week or the week before. Uh, it was the week before last because we had uh, Semyo Gargan. But we'll be doing a follow-up showing some of the functions of Ofcom and also 
a case study via bit shoots of how its powers can destroy your business with the stroke of a pen. So, so do join us then. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, Mr. Panama Hat. Thank you for everyone else turning up and having a listen along. Uh, yes. I know this is a bit maybe thank, of a, thank you for having me. a bit of an alternative stream from our usual stuff, but I think that this stuff is just as, if not more important, given yes. how little discussion there is. So please do support Panama Hat. And if you pick up the uh, book from Imperium Press, do make sure to know that uh, we sent you. <laughs> yes, yes. Good night. Yes, Good indeed. Night. Bye, everyone. Yeah, after about every time you've had the 